I'd like you to take your Bibles today and turn to Psalm 119. The title of this message is Entering the World of the Unknown. I'm not reaching in my back pocket and pulling out some message that I've given many times before. I've never given this message before. And after you hear it, you'll probably say, please don't give it again. <clears throat> but um, when you open your Bible, you enter the world of the unknown. Things you would have no knowledge of if, if it weren't for Scripture. Which is why we want to take a look at exactly some of these things that are found in Scripture that you would have otherwise no knowledge of at all. We've got about three we're going to look at today. Um, it's very, very important that you understand this particular word the word is revelation. God says that he has revealed these things unto us. Yea, the deep things of God. And so we're going to look at some deep things of God. I'm actually writing on this right now. I, I put out a, a two-minute podcast every week for this Sunday school class that I teach for people over 60. And uh, I send this out. So right now we're sort of going through this. And I don't know if I'm going to write a book on it or not, but it's something that's heavy on my heart. And so I thought I would share your, my thoughts today with this. Take your Bibles and look, if you would, at Psalm 119, verses 17 through 19. Go good, good to your servant, and I will live. I will obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth do not hide your commands from me. Lord, that is our prayer, that you would open our eyes. We might behold wondrous things out of your law. In Jesus' name, amen. Why would King David say, open my eyes? Are you talking about his physical eyes? Clearly not. He had 20-20 vision when he was looking at Bathsheba. He knew he... <laughs> His eyesight was just fine, all right? Don't let your minds go there, but I'm just simply saying, he's talking about, I don't understand this world. I don't get it. Not only does he say, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things. In other words, I want to go into the world of the unknown. I'm a stranger in this world. We're strangers, we're pilgrims, we're aliens, we're sojourners in this present world. But there are so many things that we don't understand unless we pick up this book and allow God to reveal to us things that we would otherwise have no knowledge of. The world of the unknown is a world of revelation. I used to often say at Reston Bible, I'd say take, take this book, it's the only book where we're gonna enter into the world of the unknown. And then we would do just that, just like Gary does every single week or other people that, that, that speak here. So, I'm gonna look at three areas in the time that we have. We're gonna look at the providence of God, we're gonna look at the world system, and we're gonna spend a little bit of time on developing an eternal perspective. So that's where we're headed uh, today. The providence of God is revealed all throughout scripture in different narratives, with different people, in different places, at different times in, in Scripture. Probably the greatest single narrative revealed in Scripture is the life of Joseph. Joseph in the Old Testament, I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with Joseph. He's sold into slavery by his brothers and eventually becomes governor of, of Egypt. But if you take a look at his life, you begin to see that there is a providential working. Now let me explain providence. Providence is God's ability to take man's, the good and the bad and the ugly of humanity and bring about his sovereign plan, pro video. He doesn't manipulate us, we are not puppets on a string, but he does something, and if you read through the life of Joseph, you're thinking, I don't know how you pulled this together. He's God, all right? 
So here's Joseph. His father makes him a coat of many colors, and he's 17 years old. Well, that's a good thing. But his brothers were jealous. Well, that's a bad thing. How do you know? And then Jacob says to Joseph, haven't seen your brothers in a while. Go see how they're doing. Well, that's a good thing. So he goes to a place called Shechem, but he can't find them. Well, that's a bad thing. But there's a guy standing out in the field and says, who are you looking for, my brothers? Oh, they went to Dothan. Well, that's a good thing. But when he found them, they wanted to kill him. Well, that's a bad thing. How do you know? And the older brother said, let's not kill him. Well, that's a good thing. So they sold him into slavery. Well, that's a bad thing. But while he was in slavery, he was put in charge of Potiphar's house. That's a good thing. But then Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. That's a bad thing. But he fled from her. Well, that's a good thing. But then he got thrown into prison because she said he tried to rape her. Well, that's a bad thing. But he was in charge of the prison. Well, that's a good thing. But the two prisoners in there had dreams and they didn't know what they meant. Well, that's a bad thing. But Joseph says, my God interprets dreams. Well, that's a good thing. And he interprets the dreams. And the prisoner that gets out forgets Joseph. And that's a bad thing. How do you know? Because two years later, Pharaoh has a dream and he doesn't know what it means. That's a bad thing. But the butler says there's a guy in prison that knows how to interpret dreams. Get that man. That's a good thing. Joseph gets out. He has no clothes, no place to live, nothing. That's a bad thing. He interprets the dream. He's now made second in command of all of Egypt. That's a good thing. And eventually, because of the providential working of God to bring about the Messiah, God providentially works in Joseph's life to the point where he becomes second in command. Israel winds up being birthed in the land of Goshen and through the tribe of Judah, the Messiah comes. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You don't know what is good and what is bad. You don't know. The man that said, I overheard your brothers that they went to Dothan. I, oh, I just happened to overhear. Had he not overheard, we wouldn't be here today. He goes into prison and he interprets their dreams. Matter of fact, here's what he says. He says, why do you men look so sad today? Good thing he asked that question. Because he had not asked that question, he wouldn't have interpreted their dreams and Pharaoh's dreams and Israel wouldn't have started. Had he not asked that question, Cornerstone Chapel wouldn't exist. Obviously, God would have found another way. I'm just simply saying, when you're going through this, one of the reasons I, one of the reasons I believe the Bible so much, nobody could have written this story. Nobody. No John Grisham, no great Tom Clancy, nobody could have written this story. The narrative in Scripture takes you into the world of the unknown. And right now, some of you are living with a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty, because life is difficult. And you do not know whether it's good or bad. You don't know. And so the providence of God helps us in so many ways. A little bit later on, in uh, chapter 45, Joseph plays a little game with his brothers and they come down to buy grain and eventually he says, I've got to reveal myself to my brothers. And so he says, he calls them all in, gets rid of all of his servants and he calls them in and he says, uh, says, I'm Joseph, your brother. They haven't seen him in 13 years or so. Different look, different language, different clothing. I'm your, Joseph, your brother. They were distressed. You think so? <laughs> come close. Come here, come close to me. I'm Joseph, your brother, the one you sold into slavery. 
how would you feel? And then he says this, don't worry, don't be upset. You sold me, but God sent me to save many alive. That's providence. You sold me, God sent me. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Amen. You don't know. That's why it's important to step in to the world of the unknown. Because all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I wouldn't know any of these things. The reason there is such a thing as revelation is because if man can figure things out, God doesn't need to reveal it. God doesn't tell you how to fix a car. He doesn't tell you how to throw a football. People can learn that. But you can't learn about the world of the unknown. You can't learn about demonic activity. You can't learn about lots of things unless you step in to the world of the unknown. And there are many, many factors. I've probably written down about 35 or so that I'm going through right now looking at these different things. Here's a second area of the world of the unknown. It's known as the world system. When you're reading your Bible, particularly the New Testament, you'll come across the word world. Does it mean, for God so loved the world? Does it mean the world of people? This present evil age, which is interpreted world? Is it talking about just the, the, the actual earth going to all the world? Generally speaking, it's talking about what is known as the world system, cosmos. It's an ordered system that looks really shiny well organized and it draws people in through materialism and the lust of life love not the world neither the things that are in the world all those passages that's the world system and if you didn't know there was a world system then you're not entering into the world of the unknown Gary was just talking about all the confusion that is taking place in Congress because Congress is run by the world system. I said in the earlier service, mankind is the problem. And when the problem tries to solve the problem, that's a problem. <laughs> and it's a big problem. We can't fix anything. We don't understand the human heart. We don't get it. But down there, they're, they're thinking, or that way, or whichever way Washington is, they are thinking in terms of, we're gonna fix this thing. You're not gonna fix anything. You're not gonna fix anything. I told the men, every single commencement message, and I've given a number at some colleges and high schools, but almost every speaker says this, you're the generation that's gonna change the world. What your mind can conceive, you can achieve. I get up and say, you can't change a diaper. <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about changing the world? We've been saying this for 5,000 years of recorded human history. Nothing's changed. We're on the same treadmill. Come on, get with the program. Enter the world of the unknown so that you'll understand why this place is the mess that it is. The gospel is best communicated when the conviction of those who believe it can be observed by those who don't. And that's why you are here, to hear Gary and others here on staff to preach and to teach you about the world of the unknown, to understand the deep things of God. In chapter eight of the gospel of John, we find that, um, Jesus says, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. You're a murderer from the beginning, and a liar, and there is no truth in him. Not some, 
No truth. Isaiah says, if we don't speak according to this word, there is no truth. There's no light. Zero. Not some, zero. This is a dark world. The reason Jesus says we are the salt and the light is to preserve a place that's dying and rotting. The only hope is the church. The only hope is the gospel. The only hope is Jesus. That is the only hope. There is no other hope. And when you pick up this book and you step into this, this world, we begin to find out that there's a satanic world system that is an operation. When you see some of the things that are taking place, I'm not here to try to offend or upset. I know Gary never goes into politics, but I'm just gonna step out there just a little bit. <laughs> I am, I was born before the world, the war, the war ended, not, not, not the Civil War. The, uh, <laughs> 1944, this is not the country I was born into. This is not it. I don't even recognize it. My dad was a great military man, superintendent of the Naval Academy, graduate of the Naval Academy in 1937, skipper of the aircraft carrier Intrepid, fought in World War II, fought in the Korean War. So I was raised in a very conservative household. Not a, necessarily a believing household in understanding the truth of the gospel, but a, a, good, a good household. And I have seen so many things change through the years that I am so troubled by. And sometimes we say to ourselves, where is this even coming from? The, 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 the pronoun thing. I don't, did somebody just sit around in the living room and say, I got an idea, let's all have a different pronoun. I, I don't, where does this come from? Where does this come, by, by the way, uh, mine is your highness. Uh, <laughs> and I will sue your socks off if you don't call me that. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, I know what you're thinking, Mike, you must have not done very well in school because your highness is not a pronoun. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> Do these things not disturb you? You know, Lot in the Old Testament was not a good man. But the Bible in the New Testament says he was uh, he had a righteous soul. And then it says this. It says that Lot was troubled by what he saw in Sodom. Is your soul troubled? It should be. It should be troubled. We have to live in this world. And we're passing through in many respects. Life is short. And I just think is, here's Lot, not even a great man of God, but his, what he saw taking place is what we're seeing taking place today, and his soul was vexed, troubled, disturbed by what he saw. If the church doesn't wake up, if the church isn't troubled by what it sees, there's not much hope for the country because Congress isn't troubled. Some are, there are a few, not very many, because they don't know anything about the world of the unknown. They don't get it, and you have to understand that. Lastly, I wanna talk about developing an eternal perspective. I'm gonna to avoid turning to too many passages, just for time's sake, but in Psalm 39, there's a, a, a series of statements <coughs> about the brevity of life the absolute brevity of life. A shadow, a hand breath. Other passages turn about, uh, talk about uh, grass growing up and then withering in a day. Uh, James says life is a vapor. Just like that. Like that. In my Sunday school class last week, we lost a man. He was doing great. Saw him the day before and had a heart attack. It was gone. Life is extremely short, extremely short. There's a, um, a little boy, 13 years old. I did his memorial service years ago. I think, he would be, I think he'd be 47, 48. His name was Timmy. 
I used to drive him to his chemotherapy treatments and um, when he passed away, they had moved out to St. Louis, Missouri and I flew out to do the memorial service. It was a packed house. And here's what I said when I walked up to the pulpit. Methuselah lived 969 years and he died. And Timmy lived 13 years and he died. And the Bible says they both lived the exact same amount of time. Vapor. Vapor. Gone. You've got to grasp some of these things. You've got to be thinking. You've got to be, you've got to be understanding this eternal perspective. And I, I've even thought, I've often wondered, you know, we have this thing called a midlife crisis. First of all, if you have eternal life, there's no midpoint. You don't have to get a gold chain and a red car and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I have mine in Nashville. I didn't drive it up here. Anyway, no. <laughs> but I've often wondered, you know, the older you get, you do start thinking about time. And I wondered if Methuselah ever had a midlife crisis. 969 years. When you have to be 500, did he say to his wife, where have the centuries gone? Seems like just 300 years ago, little Ricky was born. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a great Hebrew name, Ricky, at any rate. Uh, but life is short. And developing an eternal perspective helps a great deal when it comes to dealing with trials. Because you begin to realize the best is yet to come. This life is very, very short. And it really helps us in that respect. I want you to turn, if you would, briefly to 2 Corinthians for a moment. 2 Corinthians. And I want you to look at chapter 4. L listen to these words. I find these words hard to even begin to grasp. Here's what it says. In chapter 4 it says, so fix your eyes, uh, verse 18, on what is seen, but on, what, uh, on what, what is seen, but what is unseen. There's the unseen world. There's that world of the unknown. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Previous to that, he says that our light and momentary afflictions, light and momentary? If you have an eternal perspective, that's what our afflictions are, light and momentary. Um, Hebrews 11, verse 10, Abraham, it says, Abraham was looking for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. That's an eternal perspective. He was looking for a heavenly city. A little bit later it says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and confessed and embraced the fact that they were strangers and pilgrims in this world. We're not just passing through so I can go fishing every day. I don't. I like pickleball, I like fishing, <laughs> I like marathons, running backwards, I do all kinds of crazy things, no. I like those things, but I'm not gonna be attached to those things. Time is running out, and the church has got work to do, and I praise God for this church. I praise God for a man that is willing to stand up and say the hard thing week after week. Amen. I'm over time, so I need to wrap things up. Here's one amazing truth about entering into the world of the unknown. You would have no idea where you would spend eternity if it were not when Paul writes Timothy and says the scriptures were written to make us wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You may be here, you may have come for a long time, you may have heard Gary give the gospel over and over again. I never know how the Holy Spirit's gonna work, but today is the day of salvation. Your salvation is not based on how good you are, not how much money you give, not how often you go to church. Your salvation is based on the righteousness of another person, his name is Jesus. Your righteousness is nothing. 
It's rusted, it's corroded, it's broken. His righteousness is perfect, and you need his righteousness given to you as a gift to pass from death unto life. Call upon him today and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself, I need your righteousness, and today I'm calling upon you to give me everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we've had today to look into your word. It's been brief, but Lord, I believe your Holy Spirit can do a mighty work through what has been said, not from me, but from the power of your word. And now, Lord, I pray that you would bless the remainder of our day and another service that is coming up. Encourage the hearts of these people. Bless this church, and we pray for Israel. And Father, we're thankful for all that you have said and done in our lives today. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name, amen. You all have a great day. God bless you.